नमस्कार आई एम हैप्पी टू बी बैक विद यू माय डियर फ्रेंड्स एंड टीचर्स वी आर नाउ डूइंग द सेकंड पार्ट ऑफ द प्रोग्राम व्हिच वाज एंटाइटल्ड हिस्ट्री ऑफ फिलोसॉफिकल एंड कल्चरल कॉन्सेप्ट्स सो दिस इज द पार्ट टू एंड आई एम ग्लैड टू बी विद यू वंस अगेन now in the first part we started with the vedic text which is the oldest extant text that we have the rigveda and from the vedas and the upanishads and the later classical text we went through various concepts that developed and we came to a point where i explained to you that the method which is adopted in portraying the universe and understanding the universe was very unique in india very early as different from other parts of the world they resolve the problem between the worship of the ultimate reality as formless or the worship of the ultimate reality as having a form as a matter of fact it was believed that brahma could is both it manifests as without form and it manifests as with form and hence so many philosophical concepts developed in india which showed a way to the people of india showed them the way of how to pursue the ultimate goal of reaching the divine either through worshiping the divine as formless or worshiping the divine as form as the world worshiping this world in the best possible form and the beautiful forms so we came to a point recounting the whole history the different concepts the different six schools of philosophy to the point that where for the common man worshiping in the temple worshiping the divine in the shape of an image or worshiping him or her as sakshat that is as a murti as a vigraha was the most common practice and how the great temples were made which were not only for religious pursuit but which were houses for art culture patronage to all kinds of intellectual activity now when we come to a further later period let us say around uh, the middle classical period and the period that follows it there are certain ideas which became very important the idea of purush and prakriti which were symbolized by the male and the female and which was called the mithuna or the couple now the couple is the basic unit of procreation and thus creating a society so the couple the procreating couple was considered to be the ground or the fundamental societal system or the unit from which other systems followed this was also classified this idea was also classified as the idea of four ashramas it was said that biologically life depends in 
a succession of four stages when you are being raised as a child and you go for education. So, this was the first ashram called the Brahmacharya and then it was followed by the second ashram when you took a life partner and started your family it was called the Grihastha ashram because you are in a griha or a home and uh, you make a home you are Grihastha, but you not only make a home you not only procreate raise the children, but that particular stage of life or ashram becomes the productive and the procreative unit for providing sustenance to other three ashramas of life. That is the other three were as I said one was Brahmacharya and then after the Grihastha was the ashram of Vanaprastha that is when you had done your household duties, raising of children, making of money, having prosperity when you had finished all that then you wanted to think of higher things and you wanted to be out of the run of everyday pressure so that you could meditate, advise and think of whatever is the love of your life in a more sophisticated manner. For this there was the third ashram called the Vanaprastha. You went into the forest because in ancient or even in medieval times, industrial times forests were available for people to go into as they are not available anymore. So, you could go there live a simple life, a life of thought, reading, meditating, discussing things, but the sustenance for the unit of the people who lived in this Vanapastha ashram came from those who were in the world, those who were in the Grihastha ashram. So, the Mahabharat says that the Grihastha ashram is the most important, it is the best of ashram, ashramas because it provides a sustenance to all other three. So, the fourth ashram which was for a very few people who wanted to devote themselves entirely to the idea of seeking the divine. They would leave even the forest and go around begging, they would become sannyasis and they would be known as parivrajakas. So, this was the idea of the four ashramas, but along with this there was also the idea of four aims of life. Just as there were four ashramas, there were four aims of life called dharma, artha, kama and moksha. Dharma means whatever is required to be done at a given moment for the benefit of the person, the family, the society and nature and the earth as a whole at large that is your dharma, that is the path of action that you have to adopt. So, dharma was the ideal which you had to follow in practice and then in order to pursue dharma you required different kinds of instruments, material instruments and that was called artha. So, artha is not just money but it is the material wealth of which the worldly life is made of and that is the life of productivity. So, dharma, artha and then we are human beings a bundle of desires. The desires not just sexuality, but desire of every kind of human beings was defined as kama. So, dharma, artha, kama and then freedom from desire, freedom from attachment to our material belonging and freedom even from 
our concepts of what is best for us, freedom even from the concept of dharma was called moksha. When you ultimately realize the total reality and when you had finished the journey of your life by achieving everything, knowledge at its highest end. So, the four ashramas dharma, artha, kama, moksha were to be pursued throughout life. Although they are stated in this manner, but they are not to be lived one by one, but they are to be lived all together. And life is to be led in such a way that when we are pursuing one of them, the other three are not forgotten or harmed. In other words, simple words, let us say if we are making money, then we have to see that money is made by the correct means which does not cause harm to others, but helps others that is dharma. So, in making of artha, dharma is protected. We do it not under the individual desire, we do not do it impulsively, we do not do it just because of karma. We do not allow karma to take over our pursuit of dharma. So, we protect dharma, we protect uh, karma while pursuing artha and we also do not totally forget that eventually we have to get over all these smaller understandings of life and to arrive at the highest. We have to keep our minds aware of that all the time. So, we have to keep the idea of the moksha in mind, the concept of the moksha in mind. So, when we are pursuing artha, dharma, kama and moksha should not be forgotten. And similarly, even if you are pursuing moksha, you have to remember that there is dharma, there is artha and that there is kama. That is why even the greatest of the souls who claim to have reached the ultimate knowledge, they did not just retire forever into the forest, but they came back to the world like Buddha who came back and started the Dharma Chakra Pravartan or the preaching of the Dhamma. Dharma, Dhamma, Dhamma is the word Pali word for Dharma. He started the preaching of dharma for the benefit of those who are in the world, so that they could also pursue the four goals of life. When you see this image of Mithun here or man and woman, then a lot of imagery was drawn in order to show the alliance between the four ashram. For instance, in this panel here, you see that there is a couple, the Grihastha couple, a young man and woman, both made beautifully in stone and on the other side of the panel is Buddha, Buddha being worshipped by his disciple, Buddha who symbolizes the ultimate realization or nirvan and also renunciation or the fourth ashram. So, in this panel you see here that the Grihastha ashram is thinking of what is renunciation, aiming at that as well and also sustaining all those people who are pursuing the final, the Sanyastha ashram fully. Life was considered in classical India in a very balanced way. They thought that this material world, if it is pursuing the idea of moksha or salvation, then this material world is not to be considered as an impediment or as a veil of tears or a place which is full of sin or trepidations which we have to avoid. But on the contrary, life is something 
which is entirely enjoyable, if it is lived according to the dictates of dharma, in which there is no violence, in which we do not attack others, in which we do not fight with others or snatch things from others. As the Isha Vasya Upanishad said, Ma Kridha Kasya Chidhanam, that is do not desire somebody else's wealth. So, if life is led in this harmonious manner, then the arts can be pursued and they can make life even better. You see here in this image, the musicians. Music was given a very high status in ancient Indian life. It was considered to be the door to salvation. For human beings, it was said that if they pursue music, then music will make them aware of what is the ultimate aim of life and it shall make them aware of it in a very blissful, happy way. The Yagyavalka Smriti has a verse, Veena Vadana Tattvagyo, Veena Vadana Tattvagyo, Jati Shruti Visharadaha, Talagyo Cha Aprayasena Mokha Maragam Niyachati. One who is adept in the playing of veena, musical instruments. One who is adept in the playing of any musical instrument. Veena was a generic name for musical instruments in ancient times. So, one who knows the secret of playing the veena, veena avadana tattvagyo, and one who was a knowledgeable visharad in a jati and shruti. Now, these are terms for what we today call raga and swara. So, one who knew the playing of instruments, who knew the melodies, the ragas and the fine qualities of the swara, jati, shudhi, visharada and one who knew tal, one who knew beat, talagyo cha aprayasena moksha margam niyachati. One who knows all these will without much effort proceed rapidly towards salvation. In other words, music was like a lamp which is placed, let us say, on the doorstep and this lamp or what was called in Sanskrit as Dehari Dweep, this lamp will light what is outside the room and also what is inside the room. So, music had this great quality of making our life wonderful, making our life full of a very fine sense of pleasure of the quality of instruments, of the ragas, of the melodies and hence working a kind of a transformation in our minds. So, music like the lamp placed on the doorstep would light life in this world and would lead us to the higher world. And musicians were hence prized very greatly in ancient world. Now, the systems of philosophy that developed preached a wholesome ideal of life which I just indicated to you. But in order to make us aware of these ideals of life, they were constantly doing things which reminded us of these ideals. And how were they doing these things? What was the instrument of reminding us of this ideal? I told you that temples was one. But what were the temples like? The temples were full of beautiful art, art which through sculpture, through music and through dance talked about these four ideals. For instance, in this image, you have a close up of Buddha. Buddha who is the realized soul, but to whom 
the people of the world, his disciples are closely attached and from whom they want guidance and from whom they want to know the pursuit of life. Whenever we have the image of an Ishtadev or a Buddha or a Jain adept, a Jain Tirthankar, then very often as a matter of fact nearly always it is shown that he, Buddha, the Tirthankar or Vishnu is not just an individual. He is a force or if it is a Devi who is depicted in sculpture, then the Devi, the She is a force which encompasses the whole world. So, as you see in this image here that there is Buddha in the center and people are standing on his both sides. There is vegetation in the background, there are birds, animals, trees, the elements of nature. As a matter of a fact, there is the whole cosmos which you find here. So, Buddha is the center of the universe not as an individual, but center of the universe from which the whole creation flows. This idea if you remember comes or is at least recorded for us in the Purusha Sukta of the Rig Veda, the great unity where the Purush represents the universe and also the cause of the universe, the Karan of the universe and also the creation or that which has become the Karya or the effect. The same idea was depicted in other deities when they were shown in their respective temples or sculptural panels. For instance, in this you find that there is Ganga which is being anointed by the elephants which are standing on huge, huge lotuses and which are anointing her with waters. The Devi is being anointed with waters. Now, most of this imagery has to be seen in a symbolic manner, not in a realistic expectation. For instance, you find that the elephants are standing on lotuses. So, this is more of an idea that depicts these elephants are pure because they are on a lotus top and hence they are anointing the deity. As I said that the celebration of life covers every small thing. In this depiction here you see a child playing with a cart horse, a toy cart and uh, the child is dancing, almost dancing with pleasure and that joy of is depicted. A minute ago when I said that the deity is never shown just by itself, but as is shown as creating the universe, located in the universe, whether it is Buddha, whether it is the Jain Tirthankar Mahavir or any other Tirthankar Bahubali or any other out of the 24 Tirthankaras, what you see is repeated in this image of Vishnu and Vishnu is here shown as Vishwarupa again, the idea that every deity is a Vishwarupa. The concept of Shiva and Shakti became a very powerful concept. Among the various philosophies which uh, traced a lineage directly to the Vedic Samhitas or the text, Vishnu and Shiva were the ones which were related to the deities Rudra and Indra and Upendra as described in the Vedas. 
So, you find that there are later manifestations in India, which is let us say from 6th, 7th century onwards, depict all kinds of imagery which shows them as the great male force and as the great female force. In this you find here there is Devi and Devi has so many, many kinds of manifestations which are represented here by her heads. As I said that we have to look upon most of our sculpture and iconography in a symbolic manner. For instance, now here you see Shiva along with Parvati, but Shiva also having Ganga in his hair. So, this is the family of Shiva. In the background you see his two sons, Ganesha and Kartike. And on Shiva's left thigh is seated Parvati and they are in a close embrace because they are the divine couple. All the gods and goddesses except the Tirthankaras, except the Buddha as either Bodhisattva or as Buddha, all the other deities later on are depicted as a couple. They are not shown as just male. They are shown sometimes as just female, but then the male principle is also indicated in the totality of the representation. The idea that the divine gods are the procreators finds a parallel with the Mithuna or the householder and his wife in the world. So, in the reverse mode, gods are also shown as having all kinds of human attributes because with the idea of God incarnating, God taking a form as man like Rama and Krishna and doing a life, a whole life which was called Leela. This represents the close unity of Brahma as Nirgun and Sagun and being the same all together. So, here you see that Shiva and Parvati are a loving family and so the God's family is something which is just like the human family or the human family is what should be like God's family. This was the reason why in the life of gods which were portrayed as entirely human lives, many other many activities were shown. What you find here is the depiction of Ganga when she comes into the matted hair of Shiva. And you also in this other depiction here, what you see is the marriage or what was called the Kalyan, the marriage of Shiva and Parvati. Again, this reinforces the idea which I talked about a few minutes ago that whatever event happens in the life of a god or a Tirthankar reflects the whole universe as part of that event. So, this marriage of Shiva and Parvati shows that various levels of creation, various gods are there in the higher spheres witnessing this marriage. The idea that marriage has to be witnessed by a divine force is a primary idea of the various sects of Indian culture. It is not just an idea of the Hindu marriage, it is an idea of all sects, matas and matantaras that we find of Indian origin. 
so there is somebody who has to witness the marriage and that witness cannot be just a human being that witnesses the marriage. That marriage has to be witnessed by something divine. So it would be either fire, the god of fire Agni around which you go four times, in some places seven times, the idea of circumambulating the fire or not just that, the presence of various other gods that have to happen. In those philosophical sects which do not accept Agni as the god or which do not want Agni to witness the event of marriage, they place their own divinity or their own divine force which is either in the image of let us say a Tirthankar if it is a marriage for the Jain couple or some divine image of Buddha or the Granth Sahab if it is a Sikh marriage. But the presence of the divine witnessing and noting the vows which the man and the woman take in order to lead their life according to dharma is the crux of an Indian traditional Indian marriage. Yes, there were other kinds of marriages in India. This what I described was the Brahma Vivaha. There were several other kinds, seven other kinds, but out of these in four of them witness of the divinity and uh, speaking out the mantras was very necessary. And these were considered to be the best kinds of marriage. They were considered to be the best because it is before a divine force that the vows of marriage are taken. The sculptural representations keep reinforcing these ideas. Here again I want to show you a sculptural representation of the loving couple Shiva and Parvati. Not only were there sculptural representation, but these ideas were danced out in various kinds of artistic forms. These were also sung in poetry. Many poets talked about, for instance, uh, this particular uh, sculpture that you see is the depiction of a famous stanza from Saundarya Lahari, a poem composed on the Devi by Adi Shankaracharya, where Adi Shankaracharya talks about the beauty of the face and particularly the beauty of the chin of the Devi. And you see here that Shiva is lovingly fondling with the chin of his wife. You see another representation of the same stanza where Shankaracharya describes the beauty of the face and the chin of the Devi. It seems that this stanza was very popular at a certain time uh, for the Indian sculptors and that is why so many representations are available even to this day. Life in India as we have been describing it in the last uh, few minutes continued till about 10th century and when in the 11th and 12th century there was a series of very violent and disruptive invasions many things underwent change. The change came about because unlike the invasions and unlike the people who had come into India in centuries before, this time there came the Islamic people who had a radically different view of life. And 
from 11th century till about 15th century, almost for 400 years, the country went under catastrophic changes. The cities were not any longer the cities as they used to be. The social hierarchy and the system underwent change. The modes of production also underwent a lot of change. Economy was seriously disrupted and altered. And above all, the patronage to arts, which was the most distinctive feature of Indian life for thousands of years, was not only disrupted for 400 years, it was seriously restricted and not much of it was left, especially in the north of India. So, what was the effect of all this on those philosophic and cultural concepts that we have been discussing? How did these ideas discuss, adjust to the new reality and where it was necessary to adjust them? I have told you that we see a continuity of many cardinal ideas right from the Vedic times to the present day. So, continuity was an essential feature, as a matter of fact, a necessity of Indian civilization. How did they now make this continuity thrive? and preserve what was the past and also absorb the new changes. Now, when we go through the art and the literature, not much sculpture because temple construction was brought to a virtual halt, but there was enough painting and a lot of poetry which continued. How, what do we see? What are the images? What are the symbols? What are the ideas that are refurbished during this period, which is sometimes called the medieval period and sometimes called the Islamic period of India? What dominates in the medieval imagery is some kind of a tension and an opposition between the city and the wood. And there is a very clear distinction between the devotee and the one to whom you are devoted or the Lord. So, we have now emerging pair of opposites, the city as opposed to the woods, the devotee as separate distinctly separate from God. Then the world where you make money, that is the world of the grihastha ashram, the world of prosperity and worldly pursuit was seriously contrasted with the secluded world of knowledge. Knowledge was no longer part of the cities because there were not that many centers of learning left within the cities. Then there was the great flowering of music in the medieval period, because music was an art which could be pursued not just socially, but individually and which did not require a great social and royal patronage as other arts, particularly the performing arts like theatre required. And then, because of the distinction between the house holding activity and the secluded way of life, we have the stark distinction between the householder and the saint. So, the world that emerges and the world 
which is dominated by the ideas in medieval time is to be found in these paradigms which are opposing pairs and there is a lot of tension between them. If somebody wanted to understand what were the different philosophic concepts, what were the Vedas, what were the Shastras, then one could not study them in the city because the institutions did not thrive. As patronage had changed, as the new patronage was in Islamic hands, therefore a person had to go outside the city, let us say outside the big medieval city of Delhi or the city of Agra. One had to go into the woods, into the ashramas. It is in the ashramas that most of the life of art, the life of philosophic pursuits, the life of higher concerns thrived. It is in these venues that we find the pursuit was going on, not so much in the city which was the center for power, the center for military, for political hegemony and political games as well as conspiracies. The period of medieval India gave birth to an entirely new system of worship and this new system of worship was called Bhakti. As a matter of fact, Bhakti had begun much before the medieval period. It is said that Bhakti arose in the southernmost part of India, what we now call perhaps Tamil Nadu and uh, Karnataka. The great saints wrote their poetry in the Tamil language, poetry which was full of uh, devotion to an Ishtadev imagined mostly as a lover. So thinking of God now is as a person with whom you would have a very, very close personal relationship became the model or the paradigm. And pursuit of this bhakti, pursuit of this devotion and manifestation of this relationship could take various kinds of forms. Of course, the fundamental, the foremost of it was the man-woman relationship. So God was imagined as the lover, the male beautiful lover, the Krishna or the beautiful Rama to whom you were devoted. And the devotee could have an establish a relationship with the beautiful Lord either as a woman who is devoted to the Lord just as a worldly wife or a worldly lover, a loving woman is devoted to a male, a loving male. So this relationship of Sringar became a very fundamental idea and many great bhaktas of the period, Meera being one of the most uh, popular known name in medieval times, they symbolize worshipping Lord through Sringara relationship which was essentially an erotic relationship and which brought results which were beyond the world. So you see here the image of Krishna and Radha. Now as I told you the whole cult of bhakti developed much before medieval times and the earliest text known to us of a complete cult of bhakti is the Srimad Bhagavatam which people say came into a compilation around 7th century AD. In this 
you have the primary image of Krishna and his gopikas. So, the gopikas are the bhaktas and Krishna is the divine. And in this relationship, it is said that the worldly desire, the worldly shringar through bhakti gets completely transformed. Just as when any material, whether it is iron or wood or any other plastic or whatever material, when it comes into contact with fire, it immediately leaves its own quality and becomes a vapor. Similarly, when you come into contact with the divine lover, then all earthly desires that an ordinary person has for an ordinary lover evaporate and there is only the divine desire that is left or desire for the divine that is left. So, Radha Krishna Bhakti or Bhakti of Gopikas and Krishna, they are the fundamental paradigm in this period. There were many ways in which Bhakti was to be achieved. There were many ways in which the individual would think of the divine, would continue to think of the divine and think of nothing else. It was a fashion of the times that this devotion should be so intense that it should seem almost a kind of madness. And just as in a madness, we get preoccupied only with one idea, nothing else. Similarly, in bhakti, there should be only one idea, that of the lover or the ultimate Lord. That is why Bhakti was called Ananya. There should be nothing else in mind except the one whom we are worshipping. But how do you do this? What are the different instruments? Music was considered to be an extremely potent method. Now, even in ancient times, this idea was practiced and I gave you the quote from Yagyavalka Smriti. In the medieval times, music became a major vehicle to draw the attention of people towards their divinities, whomsoever they wanted to please. So, many kinds of poetries, many kinds of Mahakavyas or epics were written composed by the saint poets, that is people who were not just poets, but who were great bhaktas in themselves. And their poetry was the focus, it was the instrument through which the ordinary people aroused and practiced their bhakti. All these poems or padas, they were to be sung. They were not just written down on a piece of paper and uh, read silently as we read poetry today. No, they were composed by the great saint poets. Most of these poets were musicians themselves. They would compose an appropriate melody for their prabandha or their composition. And the disciples would sing it and then that composition will travel around their area and finally into the furthest corner of our country. The emphasis on music for the sake of bhakti required that you create a great variety of melodies or ragas as they came to be known in medieval times. Now, these ragas were taken very seriously and it was thought that every raga is meant to reflect a particular kind of emotion. So, there are certain ragas which are very good, let us say, for the serious kind of pathetic or compassionate feeling or 
that they were ragas which were very good for a joyous feeling or ragas which were even flippant. In order to understand these ragas, in order to master these ragas and go deep into them, painters would create certain scenes and events which the musicians would see and these were the miniature paintings which would depict particular ragas and raginis. For instance, here what you see is the Vasanta Ragini. In this, a lady along with her friend is shown as plucking the new, new flowers in spring. And this is the appropriate ambience in which the Vasanta Raga was sung. And when you sang the Vasanta Raga, you had this painting before you, or when you practiced the Vasanta Raga, you concentrated your mind on this painting. The meaning of the words and the composition also described the Vasanta or the spring. The Raga, not only the Raga, but also the beat or the Tala would be appropriate to the mood and all this combination would arouse the feeling of bhakti among the devotees and the practitioners. You find here another example of Rag Todi. Rag Todi is shown here as a lady playing the medieval veena, a huge medieval veena which had to be put on the shoulder and she is out somewhere in the woods. Rag Todi is supposed to be deep and uh, full of pathos or sad feeling. So, it has a feeling of karuna, it has a feeling of longing for something and therefore, in its gentleness, it depicts beautiful trees, seclusion and trees or the gentle, the gentlest of the creatures that is a pair of deer. So, you find here a pair of deer are listening to what the lady is playing on the veena. Now, it was also thought that in medieval times particularly that when you performed a great musical raga, when you sang that raga, you created a vibration which affected not only your mind or the mind of people who were around you, the listeners, the connoisseurs, but also nature, the whole universe, because it was thought uh, in medieval times, as a matter of fact even earlier, that singing which creates vibration is a reflection of the divine vibration. The supreme reality creates this world by a sound or a sound which is called Nad. Now, this Nad which creates the world is not heard by us in our ordinary consciousness through our uh, worldly ears or ears of skin, but it can be heard only in the deeper yogic experience by the inner ear. So, there are two kinds of sounds it was imagined at that time that there is the divine sound or nad which we cannot hear and therefore, it was called anahat nad that which is not created by any worldly combination of instruments or things striking each other, but it is the sound which is created by the divine force, the nada. And just as that nada is created by the divine force, by our effort, by our vocal cords or by our fingers on a musical instrument, we create a vibration which flows out of the instrument or which flows out 
of our vocal cords as a melody and this was called the ahat nad. Why ahat? Because we have struck something. This is struck sound. We have struck a instrument, a musical instrument or we have struck our vocal cords with wind and therefore, we have produced music. Now, this music which is ahat sound or ahat nad, when it is perfected, then it leads us to the realization, it leads us to the door of anahat nad. Hence, this is a repetition of the earlier idea of yagyavalka smriti. This is perhaps the most concrete example of the continuity of ideas and philosophical concepts in the Indian systems. Another example that I show you here is that of Rag Malakos. Rag Malakos is a deep profound raga in which you think about the world in a very sensitive manner and you think at a broader scale, at a wider canvas. So, here you have a couple, a lady perhaps standing and singing and on the rooftop, the bird peacock is deeply influenced by the music and is exhilarated and in the sky, you find that there are swans. Along with the bhakti cult, there was the idea that worship of God can be done through music alone. And it was said that music is where God resides. This idea again is not only a medieval idea. As a matter of fact, it is an older idea and it is said in older texts, Naham Vasami Vaikunthe Nacha Yoginam Hridaye Cha Mad Bhakta Yatra Gayanti Tatra Vasami Narada. Narad, listen to my words. Where do I live? I am not in the heart of yogis. I am not in Vaikuntha or the sleeping place of Vishnu, but I am always there in that place where my devotees, my bhaktas are singing my name. So, singing, dancing, which was highly prized in the earlier phase of our culture, the pre-medieval phase, continued to be as precious in the medieval times only that in the medieval times, it became more and more important for devotional reasons and music therefore, became exclusively, almost exclusively the realm of the bhaktas, the realms of the devotees. Now, I had told you earlier that there was this great celebration of the knowledgeable people who lived away from the city, who lived in the woods and practiced yogas or practiced the Sufi trances, who practiced uh, asceticism, who lived in great poverty and they always despised or they always preached that the worldly riches were not sufficient for any kind of understanding and as a matter of fact, they had to be given. There was a celebration of poverty, a celebration of ascetic way of life. In this image, you see that there is a yogi, a halo is shown around him. It is shown that the person is a realized soul. The person has been in trance for a very long time. The hair is very long, matted, perhaps he has been sitting there for several years in samadhi and the person is in a secluded place somewhere far away from habitation somewhere uh, where you have not even the woods but only arid uh, place 
Another depiction that through veena or singing all kinds of devotional songs, the Lord is being worshipped. Now, singing the name of the Lord, the activities of the Lord, the leelas of the Lord was practiced all over India in all the medieval languages. It was not just in one part. And these compositions, which were famous in one part, they were translated and they traveled from one corner to another. And you have examples, for instance, of the great Gita Govinda, of which you see a depiction here. Gita Govinda, the immortal poetry of Jayadev, depicts the love creda of Radha and Madhava, Krishna and Radha. Radha Madhava Yor Jayanti Yamuna Kule Rahasike Layaha. This is the last line of his first stanza. He says that I am going, let these, I am going to describe to you the great love dalliance of Radha and Krishna and let this triumph. Now, it truly triumphed because the poetry of Jayadeva Kavi was translated or the bhavas described in his Gita Govinda, the immortal Gita Govinda, were recreated by a huge number of poets and not just for a few years, but for centuries and centuries to come. So that even today, when you hear a common thumri, let us say in Uttar Pradesh, saying ja ja me to se nahi bolu, then this is a translation of Jayadev's ya hi madhav, ya hi keshav, ma kuru kaitava vadam. Don't say these deceiving words to me, go away, go away. So, you find that this immortal poetry of Jayadev traveled to the furthest corner of India and inspired poets and poetesses all over. It was not only Jayadev, but there were so many poets who had this kind of impact. Along with the worship of Radha, Krishna, Ram and Sita, other than the two main avatars of Vishnu, that is Ram and Krishna, which were also considered to be the Purna avatars, that is having all the qualities of the divine. Other than these two, there was the worship of Devi. Now, those who worship Devi, for them, Devi was the ultimate. And Devi had to be worshipped in a direct relationship with the Bhakta. Now, this relationship was that of a seeker of realization and power. It was done through devotion and various other devotional practices, tantric practices and practices of yoga but it was primarily to acquire power, power which was not for material purposes, but power for knowledge. And it was imagined that the serpent power, Kundalini, which resided in the lowest portion of the spine, it rose up to the head the top of the head and it is at this point that the ultimate realization came. So, worship of Devi became a method of realization and a huge variety of iconography of Devi was created. Devi in her various forms, some which are very aggressive, which can wipe out all kinds of things, even good and bad together, which are entirely destructive, or Devi, which is dharmic, which only kills the evil and protects the good, or Devi, which is 
in the shape of a kind of a madness or power which is beyond any social or cosmic concerns. So, these were the various forms which was worshipped and Devi was also seen as part of the consort of Shiva or consort of Vishnu. So, here we have Devi as Varahi, we have Devi as Kali. Kali is the power of Devi that destroys. In other words, when the world is to be purified first by destruction, so that new construction can take place, then that power is worshipped as Kali. And because the governance of the world has come to the stop, therefore, Shiva is shown as lying dead corpse below the feet of the dancing Devi and you find here Kali dancing on Shiva. So, this is the philosophic symbolism which is repeated in various kinds of imagery. The medieval period had a huge variety of other philosophic concepts, but they get subsumed mainly within these concepts. One of the concept was a particular strand of Islam called Sufism. In this, it was believed that just as in the Indian idea of a direct relationship between the worshipper and the worshipped, just as there was a link between the two dependent upon the worshipper. Similarly, in this particular strand of Islam called Sufism, there was a direct relationship between the worshipper and the ultimate reality. So, Sufism had a great closeness with various other sects of Indian philosophical systems and many important exchanges between the two took place. The history of Sufism is very long. Some people say that it originated in Greece, it originated primarily in the philosophic system of Plotinus. It was then adopted by some people who were in the region where Islam later on became popular and hence it became a part of Islam. But it is quite obvious that Sufi thought had certain primary and fundamental notions that there is a unity between the creator and the created. The unity of created and the creator is not so easily accepted in certain other schools of Islam, but in the Sufi system it was well established and therefore, there was room for many kinds of exchanges with the Vedantic and the other bhakti systems of Indian thought and Sufism. In the 19th century with the advent of the British and some other European powers, we come to what is often called the modern period of India. In other words, here we have now a great invasion of technology. It is a technology which we had not seen in India before. As a matter of fact, this is modern technology which had taken birth in Europe and which was the main tool through which the Europeans were conquering the rest of the world. So, when they come to India, they bring radical changes, they bring in successively the printing press, which was the first major uh, change that occurs in India. Earlier, all systems of learning had depended, depended on uh, manuscripts, which were written in various medium like 
bhurja patra tal patra and later on on paper illustrated manuscripts sometimes but with the printing press coming from europe books modern books as we see them now were introduced and dissemination of learning through books became very important so the response of the indian mind to books was that books being the seat of learning was considered as a deity in itself the book became the saraswati it was considered that saraswati now resides in a printed book itself so here you have in modern times certain very new concepts that take birth the book as saraswati the texts as deities for instance the vedas become deities because you have the printed version of the vedas sitting on your table and therefore you can regard the printed books of vedas rig sam yajur and atharvan as deities themselves this is also the time when you can make all kinds of printed images of your teachers or your gurus and therefore the elevation of guru took place in a radically different method in the 19th century onwards this is also the time when a political confrontation between those who had conquered us and the people of india had started and therefore teachers and political leaders became very important the political consciousness about the country itself was now more unified we thought of india not as a land on which different kings ruled but we started thinking of the, of india as one land and land or bhumi came to be known more and more as mata or bharat mata eventually so what you hear what you see in modern times is a very different kind of imagery for instance here in this you see that book is saraswati and book is shown as saraswati along with one of her attendants or what was earlier a sculpted image was totally transformed into a popular image which could be just printed on paper and hung on the walls so we have now the age of printed deities as distinct from the age of deities as murtis a large number of deities could be printed and they could be on every nook and corner and hence the modern printing press gave an entirely different iconography and shape and a whole presentation of realism to the ancient gods and goddesses and various aspects of it were shown what we know now as the calendar art or the religious calendars became the new order of the day so you have these images all the time and you have then the image of bharat mata as an important image and bharat mata is raised and elevated to the level of a deity in itself and so we have not only the political idea of a unified india we have also the political idea of bharat mata itself you find here that in this particular painting there is bharat mata and around her are all the major leaders men and women of the times who were working for the political independence of india 
So, you have now Bharat Mata and her children who have now to bring Bharat Mata out of the misery. So, this is the fundamental paradigm of a political description which did not exist earlier in our consciousness, but which symbolizes the modern times. Another image of Mahatma Gandhi sitting with probably a lady Sarojini Naidu spinning the charkha and the earlier flag of India and with electronic versions of paintings we have finally a something like a smart image of Bharat Mata. So friends we have seen the growth of radical ideas, we have seen the growth of ideas from the most early times, the Vedic times to the present times in India and we have seen that there is a great continuity. This continuity has come in as a result of marvelous intellectual exertion of a great desire to preserve the past and to make the modern a part of it. Modernity in India has not been conceived as a disjunct from tradition, but modernity is a continuation of tradition. Thank you very much. Namaskar.